Thank you, David. We uh, appreciate that good singing and to be here today, and I'm glad to have a little bit of a voice. I didn't have one last week. I had laryngitis, so I was grateful for that David is always so anxious to preach for us. And I think he does that kind of stuff every once in a while on purpose so he can preach, slip something in my water or something so he can preach. But I appreciate him doing that last week. And um, he was right about Wednesday night. We, we had our conference, church conference on Wednesday night and heard about the many things that God is doing in our church. And we're pretty excited about it. We continue to see the church grow. And uh, the church has been faithful, uh, and we're seeing a lot of new folks. We have two worship services now on Sunday morning, and our Sunday school attendance is up, and we're very, very grateful for that. In a time where we just heard recently that 85% of the churches are either stagnant, they've plateaued, or they're declining, our church is in the 15% that is actually growing. So we're grateful that God is using our church, and we are grateful for um, you and for God using you as we continue to try to reach this community for Jesus Christ. Well, as you know, here at Tage Creek, we study the Bible, uh, God's holy word. And we are now going through the Bible. We started in Genesis. We're going all the way through the Bible. And we are now in Matthew chapter 19. And Matthew chapter 19 is one of those chapters when we get to this particular section. A lot of people start getting nervous. Uh, and you sometimes kind of feel this tension in the room uh, when we get to this subject. Because you can see on the screen... Uh, and if you were with us week before last when I was preaching in the first part of this chapter, you know that we're talking about marriage and divorce and remarriage and what the Bible has to say about this subject. And so week before last, we looked at what the Bible teaches us about marriage. And in this message, we speak about what the Bible says about divorce. So I understand that there is um, a sense sometimes when we get to this subject, there's a sense of uh, tension. And I must say that some of the positions uh, that people take uh, don't always agree with each other when these words were written in the first century. Uh, people were in disagreement about the subject then. Uh, today, people are still in disagreement as to how to handle this subject. Um, but I must say that uh, in this message, I hope that you will realize that the message from Matthew chapter 19 is not a message of condemnation. It is not a message of judgment. It is a, not a message where we stick our finger out towards you and point our finger and scold you uh, if you've been married and divorced, but it is rather a message of hope. It is a message of restoration, and it is a message of God's redemption. And so I hope that you will listen carefully to this message. In preparation for this message, it was very demanding. I had to go back through the Bible from Genesis all the way through the Word of God and study every single reference in God's Word uh, when it refers in any way to marriage or divorce. And so it has been a very demanding message to prepare for. And we could spend a lot of time speaking about this subject. There are so many areas regarding divorce. I want to encourage you to be back tonight because tonight's message is very much related to what we talk about this morning. And uh, you think that maybe you have a dysfunctional marriage or you have seen dysfunctional marriages, uh, make sure you come back tonight because we're going to show you from the Bible um, Paul dealing with some dysfunctional marriage situations in Scripture. And um, uh, when you come back tonight, I will remind you, please put yourself in the place of Paul when we look at this passage tonight, uh, both here in Matthew 19 as well as 1 Corinthians 7, because uh, you're going to see some real messed up marriages in the message tonight and how God deals with uh, messed up dysfunctional families. So be sure and be back tonight. I, there's probably none of us that wouldn't say that somewhere in our family we have dysfunction, right? And so be sure and be back tonight. When I was working the streets as a police officer, there, we were always the busiest 
during those occasions when families got together. Have you ever noticed that? Around the holidays and any time families are getting together, we were really, really busy dealing with dysfunctional families. So be sure and be back tonight. And for those that are listening on the radio or watching on television, be sure and catch the next message after this one uh, and hear what the Word of God has to say. All right, listen, but be sure and listen to the end. Because it, don't check out on me when we first start. Stay with me until this message is finished so you can hear all of what we're talking about in this particular message. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, you'll remember that the beginning of this chapter, the Bible says that when Jesus had finished these sayings, remember again that he had just been teaching to us what it looks like to be a believer and how that it was almost counterintuitive to what the world calls success because being a true believer and follower of Jesus Christ means that we are servants, it means that we sacrifice, it means that we practice self-denial, there is suffering and there is death involved at times in being a follower of Jesus. And so after, the Bible says in verse 1, after he had finished those sayings, he left the area, he went away from Galilee, and he entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Now, just as a side note that's kind of interesting to me, is that in all the travels that we've seen of Jesus to this point in Matthew, now he has crossed back into Judea, and he's on his way back to Jerusalem, where he will be crucified upon a cross. And so this is his final journey back into this area prior to his crucifixion. And the Bible says there, in verse 2 that there were large crowds that were following him. And notice the Bible says he healed them. Now, if you've been a part of church for any period of time and you've been a part of movements where God's Holy Spirit is doing these great things and God is working tremendously and great things are happening in your church and great things are happening in your personal life with the Lord, what is it that always happens? What always happens is the religious crowd shows up and they try to throw water on what God is doing. That exactly happened to Jesus because verse 3 says that the Pharisees came up. That's that religious crowd that was always trying to trip up Jesus. And the Pharisees showed up and they asked him, testing him by asking this question, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, note in your notes or underline in your Bible that phrase for any cause. Because the issue here is, is it okay to get a divorce for whatever reason? Doesn't matter what it is, is it okay to get a divorce for any reason? Now understand that in ancient times, the Jews could get a divorce for whatever they wanted to. It didn't matter if your wife got up one morning and burned the biscuits and you didn't like the way she cooked them, divorce her. She got up, you woke up one morning and her breath stinks, divorce her. If you want to, just divorce her. She gets up and dresses and you don't like the way she's dressed, I'm going to divorce her. I don't like the way she's singing in the kitchen, I can't stand that song, I'm going to divorce you. And just for any reason, they would divorce each other. And so there were two schools of thought among the Jews. There was one school of thought taught by a rabbi by the name of Hillel who taught that you could divorce your spouse for just any reason. It didn't matter what it was, you just didn't want to divorce them, just divorce them. There was another rabbi by the name of Shammai, and Shammai taught that the only legitimate reason for a divorce was in the case of sexual sins. And so what the Pharisees are doing is they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to get him to take sides. Now the question is, is Jesus going to take sides with Rabbi Hillel, or is he going to take sides with Rabbi Shammai? Which way is Jesus going to go? Remember, Jesus is always smarter than those who try to test him. And so Jesus gives to us an answer. Look at verse 4. Here is Jesus' answer. Now if you have a Bible that is called a red letter edition. When you get into these letters that are in red, these are the words of Jesus. So follow what Jesus is saying here. Jesus said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother 
and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Where, what therefore God has joined together, let not men separate. Now notice that as we saw this passage week before last, when we talked about God's plan for marriage, this is God's plan for marriage. What God said about marriage from Genesis is in Genesis chapter 2, God explained to us what marriage was all about. The Bible says that God created all things. He created the animals and he created Adam. God looks around at his creation and his beautiful mountains and the oceans and the land and the plants and the flowers and these animals that are running all around and God said, it is good. But he looks at Adam and he says, something is missing with Adam. Adam needs something else. So God created Eve, someone of likeness to him and yet different. He was male, she is female, God made Eve. Hey, and by the way, do you remember what Adam said the first time he saw Eve? You remember what we said he said? He said, Eureka! And ever since I preached that sermon, I walk through the house, and every time I see Carol, I say, Eureka! I'm telling you what, it's great when God gives you a helpmate. It is great when God gives you someone that you can love. And so God gave to Eve. He gave Eve to Adam. And Adam was happy and to the point of shouting, Eureka! And, and God said, therefore, a man and a woman shall leave their father and mother and cleave to their wife. Now remember that word cleave means to glue. We become glued to one another. And so God, Jesus reminds us that God's intent from the beginning in Genesis, God's intent was always for us to have a permanent union. That was God's intent. God's intent that marriage would be between a man and a woman, not between two men, not between two women, not between groups of people, not with a human and an animal. God's plan for marriage was between a man and a woman. Jesus said from the beginning that has always been God's intent. And so God's plan was for a man and a woman to get married. It has never been God's intent for any of us to get a divorce. That was God's plan. That was, came from our precious Lord. And so he reminds them that it was not God's flippant kind of attitude that let's just get married and if we don't like the way they cook or the way they look or the way their breath smells or, or the way that they look when they, or the way they sing or whatever, that we're just going to divorce them. That was never God's intent, Jesus says. Jesus reminds us of the sacredness of this marriage. He reminds us of, of how it is a gift of God that we're married to one another. And so it's very important that we see this. Now, let's go on. So they came back from Jesus' response by asking another question. Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? Now notice that um, in your notes, verse 7, note Moses' command. Just note the word command there, that Moses commanded it. Because Jesus is going to respond in verse 8 by saying, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce. Note that. God did not command you to get a divorce, but God allowed divorce for a reason. There was a reason, though it was never God's original intent for us to get divorce. The Bible says that God allowed it. In the law of Moses, it was allowed. Why was it allowed? Jesus tells us why it was allowed. It was because of the hardness of your heart. Now, what does that phrase, hardness of heart, mean? Well, you have to go back in history to see what was going on prior to this law that Moses gave us. Prior to this, the divorce rate was really non-existent. You say, wow, what was going on then? Well, I'll tell you what it was. If they didn't like the wife, they just killed her. So that's why there was a low divorce rate prior to the law of Moses. They just killed them. They'd drag them out and stone them. They would take them out, and, and if, they, if they committed adultery, they were dragged out in the street, and they'd kill them. 
And so when, when the Bible says that God allowed divorce, it wasn't that it was God's plan for that to happen, but it was that God saw the evil and the wickedness of human heart and the sinfulness of the human heart. And these men were beating their wives and they were physically abusing them and they would kill them. And so it was God's mercy, it was God's grace, it was God's love that allowed Moses to give to them a certificate of divorce. It spared the lives of the women. And so it was God's goodness that even allowed that to happen. Now, in your notes, be sure and remember that when they're talking about is it lawful to divorce, that word lawful refers to the law of Moses that we're talking about in the Old Testament. And now uh, we're talking both in verse 3 as well as here about divorce. Now, be sure and understand the word divorce. And that's really important to your understanding of what the Bible says about divorce. The word divorce literally means to put away. It means literally a tearing apart. In other words, you're no longer one, but you're torn apart as though you were never one. To put away. That is the Jewish understanding all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, all the way uh, until this day. The Mosaic law, the law of Moses divorce bill, the Jews referred to it as a bill of cutting off. There is no hint, there is no thought on the part of any of the Jews from the law of Moses that divorce meant you were still married. Somewhere along the way, someone has perpetuated the idea that after you get divorced, somehow you're still married. Some have referred to it as just separation from bed and board. That is not scriptural. The word divorce in the Bible means a cutting off. It's as though you were never married. As a matter of fact, when you study the Old Testament in the, the law of Moses and you study Deuteronomy, all the references to someone who has been divorced always states of them they are their former spouse. It never says they're still their wife. It says they're their former spouse. They're not married. They're not merely just separated. They're not merely just kept from bed and board. They are cut off. They are put away. And it was the Jewish understanding that it meant absolute dissolving of that relationship. They were not still married. And you need to understand that. Because many people cruelly speak to those that are divorced, even for legitimate reasons, and tell them they are living in adultery. And that is not scriptural to do that. Because the word always meant a dissolution. It meant they were still not married. Now, uh, then let's move on and, and look at what else, verses 4 through 6, that we want to talk about, is that Jesus responded by giving to them a definition of what marriage is intended to be. And uh, I, uh, somewhere along the way, I have either lost the button up here that I change those slides with, or uh, one of you guys took it home with you. I don't know. So Dan's trying to help me today, and uh, I'm trying to give him these hand signals, and he thinks I want him to bunt or something. I, I think he's laid down a couple of bunts back there. But go for the fence this time, Dan, and change slides. Was that pretty smooth in me or what? He just wasn't changing the slide with my bunt signal. <laughs> the, uh, the law in Eden is that reference we made in Genesis 2 to when God said that marriage should be between a man and a woman in a permanent relationship. He also refers here to the seventh commandment. Jesus says that um, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. That's from Genesis 2 that we talked about. It was not God's plan. But Jesus goes on to say in verse 9, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So what Jesus is teaching us there is that the seventh commandment, Genesis 20 and verse 14, is the seventh commandment that simply says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And so the reference here is to the seventh commandment. And so... Um, 
Also, Jesus is referring to Deuteronomy chapter 24. I wish we had time to go back to Deuteronomy 24, but put it in your notes and go back and read Deuteronomy 24 at home this week and really study that chapter because it's pretty clear on what the law of Moses teaches us about the Jewish understanding of what divorce is. And so, um, here I'm buttoned. <laughs> Verse 7 says that Moses commanded them to divorce. Jesus said he allowed divorce. Dan, look at me. Hey, focus. <laughs> Somebody go back there and wake him up. I, I think he's got earplugs in listening to the Reds or something. I don't know. But anyway... <laughs> Jesus referred to the hardness of heart. Moses allowed it. But note these verses in your notes and go back and read this. These are the verses that teach us what happened to someone prior to the law of Moses. Genesis 38, 24, Leviticus 20, 10, and Deuteronomy 22, 22 says that prior to God allowing divorce, women were just taken out in the street and killed. And so that's the reference there uh, that you'll want to read. Adultery at that time was such a heinous crime that it was a crime against the Hebrew state and it was a crime against God, a crime against divine law as, as told in the seventh commandment that you shall not commit adultery. The Jews looked at it as such a terrible thing that it was a capital crime to commit adultery. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that God in his grace and God in his mercy and kindness and love allowed divorce to protect the life of the women who sinned against God and against their husbands. When Jesus was speaking these words in the first century, for 14 centuries, it was the understood among the Jews for 14 centuries prior to Jesus speaking these words, it was always understood that marriage meant that the relationship was dissolved, that they were no longer married. <laughs> the reason why in this passage of Scripture that remarriage is not mentioned is because it was never an issue. It was just known for centuries and centuries. Even... Shammai and Hillel, the rabbis that taught about divorce, agreed that it was okay for someone to experience remarriage and to go on with their life after that divorce. <laughs> You'll never live this down, will you? <laughs> they wanted to know, the real question of this passage was, is it okay to just divorce someone for whatever reason? The subject matter here is not really about remarriage. The subject is, can I just get a divorce for whatever reason I want to? So there's several things we want to learn as believers about how important marriage is in our relationship. I've already mentioned the two schools of thought, so Dan, let's just go on and, and look at some of these things that, uh, that are interesting to us and important to us to remember. And that is that Jesus taught in verse 9 that adultery... It, this heinous crime against your mate, this abandoning of your relationship, is such a terrible thing that it was a breaking of the marriage covenant. You broke your marriage covenant when you sinned against your mate by committing adultery. So what Jesus was teaching us is that just frivolous reasons for getting divorced are not reason enough to be divorced. Just because you don't like the way they're dressed or their biscuits or all of that stuff we mentioned earlier. Jesus is teaching us that's not a reason to get a divorce. That's not a reason to put away your wife and no longer live with her. Are we all going to agree with each other all the time about everything? Absolutely not. Now, I must say that my wife is always right. And I have learned that the key to a successful marriage is for me to say, yes, dear, because she's always right. But now some of you don't have perfect marriages like we do. And, and there are things that come up that maybe she wants to paint a room blue and you want it green. Okay, let her paint it blue. It's just not that big of a deal. It's just not worth divorcing over. Let's say she wants to cook salmon tonight and you'd rather have a hamburger. 
Well, let her fix salmon. Who cares? It's just not worth going to divorce court over. My goodness, Jesus is teaching us that that frivolous stuff that most of us fight about, it's just not worth it. And I will tell you as a pastor that a lot of the times when people come to me and they're having marital problems and they tell me I just don't love her anymore or she says I just don't love him anymore, normally it's this frivolous, little bitty, stupid kind of stuff that just don't really matter. And Jesus is saying that's just not a good reason for divorce. But this bonding, this cleaving to one another should bind us together to the point where every little thing that comes up and every little fox that comes around is not going to cause us to get a divorce, but we're committed to one another in this relationship. So we have some things we want to take home with us uh, to learn from Jesus. And I wish we had more time because I've had to go through the Bible and study everything the Bible says about marriage and divorce and preparation for this message. And we could probably spend a week talking about all of these issues that surround the issue of divorce. But I want to leave you with some principles that I believe Jesus is teaching us that is vital to our understanding of what the Scripture says. Because I am appalled by churches who, and the way that many churches treat people who have gone through a divorce. Many churches have turned their backs on people. I've had people right here in our own county who have come to me and said that my wife and I went through a divorce and they told us we were no longer uh, welcome in the church because we went through a divorce. That's appalling to me. It's appalling to me when the worst critics you have when you go through these troubles and brokenness and a broken marriage that the most critical people sometimes are people you go to church with. That's appalling to me. The day... When the day comes, and I'm thankful Tate's Creek is not like that, but if the day ever comes when this church or any church says to someone that because you've gone through a divorce, you're not welcome in the church, you cease to be the church of Jesus Christ. When the day comes when somebody comes through our doors as they have, I was telling our Sunday school class today, I will tell you this because you probably don't, won't know who I'm talking about at this point because some time has passed. But this church, to my knowledge, first-hand knowledge, we have had people that have attended our church who have been homosexuals. One Sunday I looked back and there was a couple of lesbians on the, on the back row just hugging it out. And, and we've had that... In, People attending, we've had prostitutes, we've had drug dealers, we've had drug addicts. We had one guy that later told me after being in our church that when he came to our service, he was on cocaine while he was in our service. And we've had people, and I'm not saying that bad, I'm saying that we welcome everyone. We welcome the guys that come in here with $1,000 suits, we welcome that. But we welcome guys who come in here with their shorts on and dirty t-shirts and we've had folks to come in and smell like they hadn't showered in a month and I mean we, we love you. We just love everybody. We're like Broadway auto sales in Lexington. We just love everybody. <laughs> Amen. We want you to come to Jesus and we want to love you. And when you're hurting the most and you're broken the most, the church family just comes to you and we want to wrap our arms around you and tell you we're not here to judge you. We're not here to condemn you. We're here to love you. And we're here to teach you of, of God's redemption and God's restoration and God's love for all of us. Getting a divorce is not the unpardonable sin, nor is it the end of the world. It's an opportunity for God to now take your life and put it on a new path. And we praise Him for the kind of Savior He is. Remember that what we've seen is that God created, initiated, and authenticated the institution of marriage. Marriage comes from God. Number two, marriage must be viewed as a sacred gift of God. Now, I know we joke a lot about our spouses, and me and Carol joke a lot too. But let me say this seriously. Men, that woman that you're married to is a gift of God to you. Ladies, that man you're married to is God's gift to you. When God looked at Adam, he said he's incomplete. I'm going to give him someone to make him one, to make him complete. And he gave him Eve, and he shouted, Eureka. And I hope that God puts it in your heart, guys and ladies, to look at your spouse and say, Eureka. Look at what God has given me. She is God's gift to me. That's a beautiful thing. 
And it should be sacred to us. We take marriage so lightly in our culture today. It's like, well, I, I might marry this person. And I've had people who tell me this. I'll marry them and just try them out for a while and, and see if it works out. That's not God's intent for marriage. You say, well, you know, we'll get married. And if it doesn't work out, we can always get a divorce. Well, what kind of attitude is that? And I've actually had people who tell me that even before they get married. I hope that all of us will learn, and young people that are not married, please learn that marriage is a sacred gift of God. It is a blessing from our Lord. Number three, remember this. Marriage is intended to be a permanent union. It's not a tryout. It's not just let's see if it works out kind of thing. It is intended to be a permanent union. Number four. We also learn from Jesus that divorce is the last resort, not the first choice. When problems come into your way, and you have to deal with problems, and you will. When you get married, there are things to deal with. Normally, it's over finances. That's normally like on top of the list when it comes to marital problems related somehow to money. And those kind of things will happen. And maybe you feel a lot of stress over work or a lot of stress over things going on in your problems come into your relationship. But the first thing that pops in your head is not, can I get a divorce over this? The first thing that comes to your head is, let's get this before the Lord and let's get this worked out. And so marriage is the la or divorce is the last resort and not the first choice. Number five. Number five, Jesus taught us that when your spouse breaks the marriage bond, he refers to it here as adultery. In the message that we will see tonight, um, there's also references uh, there to abandonment of the relationship. And by the way, divorce was given originally because of the abuse. Remember that hardness of heart thing? That was spousal abuse. They were killing them. They were beating them. And that's why divorce came along. And so you can remember these three words in reference to divorce. You can remember adultery, abuse, and abandonment. And these are things that the Bible refers to uh, when divorce happens for these reasons. And uh, it just happens. And sometimes it does happen in our lives. Your wife leaves you or you leave your wife and, and they have nothing to do with it. They become an innocent party. You abandon that relationship. Maybe you go out and commit adultery. Maybe, maybe you just abandon that person. Maybe you're just trying to physically kill this person. And God makes exceptions that you can get away from this abandoned relationship and move on with your life. But where the marriage bond is broken in adultery, the Bible clearly teaches us that you're free to divorce and remarry. There's nothing sinful about that according to Scripture. Now let's look at number six. Number six teaches us that, please hear this, because one of the things that happens to us we know that there's a large divorce rate in our nation. We know that. And we know that there's a lot of, and we're going to address this again tonight, but there's a lot of people, younger guys nowadays, that just live together and they don't want to get married because they watch their parents get a divorce and they don't want to go through that. So that happens too. And that's something we'll, we'll deal with tonight. Maybe you've gone through divorce in your life. Maybe your kids have or, or your parents have or you have. Maybe you would just say, you know what, I messed up. I, I made some really bad choices in my life. Maybe you're the one that's totally guilty of the reason you divorced. You know what? It's not the end of the world. You know why? God is a healer of brokenness. Isn't that wonderful about Jesus? That Jesus is the one who heals our brokenness? Did you know that why did Jesus die on the cross and resurrect from the grave? So we could be what? Forgiven. I mean, sometimes we make stupid choices. It's not just in relation to marriage. Sometimes we make other choices to sin against God and disobey God and sin against... And guess what he does? He forgives us. He forgives us. How many of you want to run out of our church everybody that's ever been divorced? How many of you want to ruin everybody out of our church that's ever committed any other sin or done anything else wrong or gone against God's plan and purpose for their life? My friend, we would all run out of this building because we've all broken the laws of God. We have all broken God's plan for life. And so none of us would be left. No wonder Jesus said of the woman caught right in the act of adultery, 
I mean, they, I don't want to be too vivid, but I mean, they see it happening. And they want to stone this woman. And Jesus said, well, I tell you what, let's get a rock. Let's pretend like this is a rock. Let's take this rock, and whichever one of you is without sin, you throw it first. So I'm saying to you that all of you churches that may be listening to us, uh, because we, we welcome people that are broken, and we welcome those who've gone through broken marriages. But if you're listening to this message on the radio or watching it on television, and you're the kind of attitude that says we don't welcome people into our church family because they've been divorced. Here's a rock, throw it at them. Because any of us, has any of us ever completed all of God's purposes and plans for our life? Absolutely not. That's why Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, was to make us whole again. We praise him for being that kind of savior. He's the healer of brokenness. Number seven. Number seven is that by virtue of the fact that Jesus is calling us to come to himself for forgiveness, there's a principle that we learn, and I tell everyone this, that comes to my office and says, I'm going through a divorce. I tell them this, everybody, almost without exception, I will say this. Jesus is more concerned about what you plan to do than with what you have done in your past. Because when you come to Jesus, and you may come today and say, you know, I really messed up our marriage. I'm guilty. I, I messed our marriage up. Or maybe in your own heart, we're not going to embarrass anybody. We're not going to ask you to stand up and say we did this or that in our marriage. I'm, no, 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 no. But between you and God, you would say, you know, me and my wife really went about it all wrong. Does that mean we should feel guilty and condemned and maybe we should get a divorce and try to go back to the people? Who, Absolutely not. No, 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 no. What that means is, as we will find out in 1 Corinthians 7 tonight, is that Jesus said, I'm going to take you right where you are, and I'm going to take you into the future and give you a light and a life like you've never known. If you just trust Jesus, he's the healer of brokenness. He's the forgiver of sins. He's the one that takes the crooked path and makes it straight. What a Savior he is. I'm sure glad I know him as my Savior. Quit feeling guilty when you've come to Jesus and laid it on the cross. Church members, don't make people who've been divorced feel guilty. It's all on Jesus' blood. It's all on him. We welcome you. We love you. Now let's grow together into our tomorrows that all of our lives and all of our relationships might be made whole in Jesus, that we might walk hand in hand as a church family with all of our past brokenness and all of our past mistakes, we're going to walk in the blood and forgiveness of Jesus as one family glorifying him. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we're so grateful that you're not just sticking your finger in our face trying to condemn us and trying to be judgmental toward us and trying to, to make us feel like we're just second-class citizens because we've gone through brokenness and pain in our past. We thank you that you're a Savior who died on a cross and rose from the grave that we could be forgiven and that mistakes we have made can be made right. And that when we lay our personal lives and we lay our marriages on the altar of God, you put us on a straight path of blessing and sacred marriage and, and of joy in our relationships. Father, let this be a wake-up call to those of us who are married, that we would treasure our marriage, that we would cultivate our relationship, and that we would protect it, that God may be glorified in our homes. I pray for those who've gone through divorce and, and they feel the brokenness and sometimes they feel abandoned even by church members and, and they feel guilt because people are pointing their fingers at them. I pray that they would realize that in Jesus Christ we, we can have a great future even when we may have sinned in the past or, or we may have made bad choices. That you're a God of restoration and redemption and hope. And so, Father, I pray that we'll receive your word and we'll lay our all on the altar of Jesus. In your precious name, amen.